now your helicopter is exploding. Time to add some pyro explosions to it. I know you've been waiting for it for a while, so here we go. Remember in the beginning, we had our helicopter where we created a centroid from it, and then we moved the centroid to the front, and we used pyroburst source to create the explosion forces that we used uh, in uh, our RBD simulation. And I told you that this is something we might use later for our actual explosion. In the end, while doing several iterations, I ended up not using this pyroburst source, but really uh, catering my explosion to the RBD seam that I had. So uh, what I ended up doing is importing my uh, RBD geo cached. Uh, let's go to our first frame 1431. And this is the frame on which my simulation happens, and this is the frame on which the RPG hits the helicopter. So what I ended up doing is, let me just template the helicopter. I ended up isolating a part one in the back of the cabin and another part in the front of uh, the nose of the helicopter. And I'm going to use those pieces to attach explosion sources to them. So later when I have this nose flying, I have some smoke and um, fire attached to it because this is going to be one source of the explosion and another one is going to be in the back where this piece is. So what I'm doing here, I have this piece in the back, I'm extracting its centroid and I'm initializing a start frame, 1431. Uh, you can also not initialize it in, as an attribute, but in Pyro Burst Source, uh, just enter it manually in the burst animation. Instead of having the timing here to use attribute, you can set it manually here. Either way works. So here, let's take a look at what we have in the Pyro Burst Source. It is a very useful node. I very often use it for all my explosions now. It gives you all the necessary attributes for your explosions. It gives you burn, it gives you the temperature, it gives you the density. And it creates really nice noise and the breakup on uh, all those attributes. So you can go look through these uh, parameters. But what this really is, it is just some spikes coming out of a center. Then they are converted into points and those points have different attributes on them. And then this, uh, uh, those spiky thingies are animated. You can see in my case, they're animated for two frames, 1,431 and 32. Remember, because we are attaching it to the part of the helicopter, if the helicopter is moved, so is the source. And for two frames, it actually looks pretty cool because it's growing in size and it looks really nice when the um, bright fire part is growing. And then uh, we have the second part where we isolated our nose. And I'm transforming here a little bit manually this uh, nose as this part moves aside. So here it is at frame 1431 and 32. In this switch, it just moves uh, after 1431. I just did a little bit of a manual transformation. Again, it was a lot of back and forth. Uh, checking, playing around with my simulation and making manual adjustments. Yeah, and uh, this way we have our source that we will later convert into a volume. Uh, aside from that, we also have some trails. You know how you have beautiful explosions, you have pieces flying off this explosion that are on fire. We're using pyro trail path and pyro trail source for that. So let's see what we have here. We have our start frame point. Let me remove my templates. Here is our point. Uh, we have just a random normal applied to it. Then uh, we have um, some necessary attributes that will control how many um, trails we have. We are time shifting it to frame 1431 and we have our pyro trail path. And this pyro trail path, we're taking into account our buildings and our ground. You see we, here we have those uh, collisions, building and ground. And the way we do that, if we uh, scroll here to the bottom, we have uh, basic collisions. So here I'm referencing my buildings. 
to uh, so that when the pieces hit the building, they actually that's where they are going to stop. Not the pieces, but the end of the trails that imitate as if there is a piece on fire. Yeah, so this is a simple pyro trail path. You've probably used it before. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on all the settings. They're really self-explanatory. Uh, whoever did the development, thank you very much. Your explanations when we hover over the parameter, all the two tips are very, very helpful. So I believe if you want to know more, you can just go through them and understand what's going on here. So we have this pyro trail path, and then there are a few attributes that are being created. We have the temperature, we have the trail length, and we have the trail radius that are being randomized per trail. And after that, our pyro trail source actually creates points for it for us. And you see right now, actually, I am visualizing in the viewport a temperature attribute, trail temperature. The temperature exists on the ends of those trails, and then it fades off so that the ends of the trails are red and they are on fire. You will see that I actually have two branches here. And what's happening is this branch on the right is what we will use for sourcing during an, our actual explosion. I want these bright ends to participate in my simulation. And on the left heart, uh, side, I will have extra volumes, extra uh, points. Let me just show them to you uh, that are turned into volume, but they will be used directly in the render. I'm actually going to just uh, convert those points into volumes. And you see the difference is actually pretty minor. The difference is that here in the um, uh, trail components, I'm actually scaling it along the trail. So you see I have much smoother fall off here comparing to this. And the reason for that, actually, initially, I just used those uh, trails in the simulation. Everything looked nice, but I felt that the tips are not hot enough when I use one shader for the explosion. And in the Karma XP shader, um, it's not like the pyrobake volume node. You do not have, like, let me add you and show you. If I add pyrobake volume, I have separate for parameter for secondary fire, where I can control exactly this type of secondary fire if I merge it into my uh, render result. But I could not find this parameter in my pyro XPU shader. That's why I decided to create it here and merge it back and call it temperature. And I, will, I needed to adjust this temperature manually so that it's one shader it needs to work for both. That's why I created a separate uh, line here. And you see exactly what I'm talking about. I'm adjusting the temperature here, multiplying it by three times so it's bright enough when I apply the explosion shader for it. Maybe by the time you're watching it, this has been already fixed and that option exists on the Pyro um, Mantra, or sorry, Karma XPU shader. But it did not when I was creating this setup. So after that, we have our uh, total... Uh, source, we have our explosion and we have our um, trails. Here they are. Uh, and I'm caching them. That's uh, usually good practice. I tend to cache all my explosion sources or my all my pyro sources. And you will notice that I'm actually caching them with eight substeps. Because especially in the beginning of the explosion, I want to have really uh, a lot of uh, detail and uh, maybe uh, a little bit more than uh, later, but in the beginning, the pieces are moving so fast and there is so much movement happening. I want to cover all of that. So I need to do a lot of computations between the frames, which means that more substeps I have, uh, better, uh, more substeps, uh, more geometry I can source into my pyro solver. That this is almost it. I have my explosion source cached, and we are almost ready to dive into the explosion itself. If you look at our final render of the explosion, you will notice that uh, after the explosion happens and the helicopter goes down, we have this really nice influence of the helicopter rotors onto the explosion smoke. And this is something that I ended up adding later into the simulation, because initially I used just the sourcing that we had, and uh, the helicopter rotors, they are moving, they are colliders in the simulation, they are contributing it, uh, to it, but it always felt to me like it was not enough, and I wanted to exaggerate this effect. And for that, I ended up creating a separate force that imitates 
the rotor force. Now let me show you how it was done. This is uh, this part here on the right side, top rotor wind force. So what I did here is I'm importing the animation of my helicopter, uh, then I'm unpacking it. I'm using just the um, uh, proxies because I don't need the high-res geometry for it. I'm trailing it to make sure I have a velocity attribute because this is going to be crucial for the setup. And of course, I don't want the propellers to stop affecting everything at the moment of uh, the explosion. I want them to continue. So you see the velocity continues, the rotators, the rotators, they continue to rotate as the helicopter is falling. So we add our destruction geometry here. And after that, I will isolate just the rotors. I'm isolating the rotor geometry. You can see there is a little bit of a manual cleanup that's going on. In the end, it's going to, going to be only these two rotors because the rest breaks off really, really quickly in the beginning. And I don't want to take them uh, into account when um, they are falling somewhere strange and on the ground and we will create some kind of a detached torna tornadoes. But we will do just with these two. I'll show you how to. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a bound around those uh, rotors and I'm using a sphere type of the bound and you will see I'm actually expanding it quite a bit. So there is a upper and lower padding added to this bound. I have the sphere and then I'm creating a bunch of points inside the sphere. And this is going to be a, our custom velocity field made of those points. Then what I'm doing is I am trailing those uh, rotors and I'm trailing them six ghosts of the trails. I'm keeping them. And after that, I'm just adding some uh, color there and I'm doing an attribute transfer by color, but I'm also transferring velocity. And you will see this is what happens when I transfer the velocity after the trail. If I did not do the trail, the velocity would look like this, which is really strange and obviously not enough. So. I played around with this trail number. You could make maybe increment a little bit less. If you do increment 0.5 and increase the trail length, you can make it look even more accurate. For example, this, you can get an even smoother shape, but then you will have to do more computations when you're saving it to disk. So it's up to you. Uh, if you want it more accurate, feel free to change that. Just recache it yourself. Let me just change it back to how I had it to one. Just recache it. Okay, so this is my uh, velocity field. I have velocities like that. I just want to um, adjust them a little bit because rotators are rotating really, really fast. So I'm lowering the velocity. But of course, I don't want it to be just straight round. It's going to be boring. I'm going to add some noise to it and make it look a little bit interesting. So you see I'm adding noise uh, to my velocity attribute here. And I'm doing it one more time when I'm adjusting directions only and I'm adding some uh, zero centered noise. So in the end, it should look quite interesting. You see some waves, you see some uh, details. And one last time, I'm adjusting the length of this velocity and the way I do that. Uh, remember, I transferred the color, color from the rotors onto those points. So I had this color fall off here. Let me just turn off my velocity. I have this color fall off. So when the space inside this point cloud is closer to the rotors, the velocity is stronger. When it gets further away, the velocity gets weaker. And that's what's happening here. So we are ramping it by this color. And when I visualize my velocity, you see where the rotors are, it is stronger. As it gets closer to black, it is weaker and weaker. Okay, this is what this is. And we even have a ramp that you can adjust manually. And if you want, you can change those parameters to make it even more interesting. And after that, it is cached. It is cached for uh, 1,500 uh, frames with some sub-steps because, again, uh, in the beginning especially, I will be using quite some sub-steps on my geometry. And I noticed when I was sourcing this field only one time per frame, I started getting really elongated, strange, uh, velocity, it, it is as if my smoke was a little bit dragged, you could see it, and it's because this wind was not sampled uh, enough times. That's why uh, after learning this lesson through uh, trial and error, now I know that I needed to cache it uh, four times between every frame.
And after that, we can add a few more uh, adjustments, some noise onto the velocity, but this is uh, happening after a cache, so that's very easy for us. We can do it anytime we don't need to recache things. And after all that, let's just see how this velocity field is going to look. This is how it is going to look. Quite nice. We have some uh, nice shapes. They're not uniform, and we have some good resolution. So this velocity field we'll be using when we are sourcing it into the simulation. You see here, top rotor, um, top rotor wind volume water. That's uh, I'm going to leave it like this. So this is my rotor force. And... Uh, uh, yeah, and there is a little bit of the sources in there. So now you're ready to dive into the pyrosolver itself and see how we did the actual explosion.